In this video, we are taking a look at the Bite Me Room from Try Hack Me. Just released a few days ago, and without any further ado, let's get to it. So hey, over on my screen here, I have a terminal open. I'm running the Kali Linux virtual machine. I'm going to end up creating a directory called Bite Me. And I'll be using that as the kind of hub for all of my notes and files and folders as I connect and work with the Try Hack Me machine here. Uh, I am, of course, connected to their VPN sudo open vpn john hammond uh or at least the name of my user dot open vpn you can do the very same on your side but just make sure you are connected and the room that we're going to be taking a look at is bite me the description here is stay out of my server and it's relatively recent it has about 75 thumbs up at the time of recording uh medium difficulty a couple people on the scoreboard i will admit i'm going to go through this in retrospect i have completed this room already but i've spun up the machine here is the ip address we'll go ahead and work with and this actually has a task again at the time of recording that i think is just a filler one has changed me, has update me with no actual values here. Uh, so we'll mark that as complete <laughs> for the sake of, of doing that. Uh, and then we'll go ahead. Hey, I'm glad I increased my streak. Uh, now let's go ahead and start the machine and get the flags. I have already started the machine with this button here. And we just need to go ahead and break into this thing. It asks, what is the user flag? What is the root flag? The question is to prove, hey, you have gained initial access and you have compromised the machine. So let's get back to our terminal. And I'm going to move into that bite me directory. I'll go ahead and create a readme, even though I know I won't end up using it because I just tend to do it out of habit. Uh, we'll go ahead and zoom in here as quick as we can. At least keep track of the IP address. We'll go ahead and throw that as a variable. So we might be able to use that maybe in bash or something. There we go. Take notes of it. And now we can go ahead and actually slap that in as a variable to use. With that, let's go ahead and create an nmap directory, excuse me, an nmap directory, because I know I am going to want to scan the machine. Uh, nmap is that command and program to do network mapping or to scan for open ports on a specific box. Uh, I'm going to use tacsc for default scripts, tacsv to enumerate versions, and tacon to output in the nmap format. And I'm going to save it in that nmap directory that I had just gone ahead and created. Uh, we'll call that initial, and then we can use the IP address that we've just made as a environment variable or just a variable for us to use i should have actually ran that with tac v so i could have increased the verbosity or verbosity and i would have been able to see the output as it comes through but anyway i just hit v on my keyboard and that'll allow me to increase it just as well uh looks like it did find two services not going to tell me what they are just yet maybe i should have increased that verbosity even more um Okay, and that started some scans, whatever, whatever, whatever. Looks like it found a couple options. So we found port 22 open, which is SSH, or the secure shell Linux kind of remote control functionality in that protocol. We also have port 80, or HTTP, an open web server and a website running on that host. So that gives us some good insight. We could go ahead and actually navigate to that in our web browser. I'm going to go ahead and create a new tab, and I'll go to that URL. Looks like it just has an Apache 2 Ubuntu default page, which is again, just kind of, hey, the native by default installation page for installing the web server Apache, just that service, that's that server software. I'm scrolling through the HTML in case I hit anything in here. I don't think that they did. Uh, all I did was hit control U on my keyboard to access that or right click and view page source. So with that said, there's not a whole lot to actually access here on this page. Uh, I don't know where any other files might be. So what we can do is we can go ahead and do some like directory busting or content der busting to try and guess what other locations might be present on this actual server. Now, a good way we could do that is by using a tool like GoBuster or Durbuster or Derb or Brute, whatever. Uh, I am a new fan of Ferox Buster. Ferox Buster is actually a Rust based when rendition of uh you know directory brute forcing i could have very well have ran a uh, rust scan rather than nmap if i wanted to continue on that hey super fast hip mainstream uh <laughs> rust fanboy stuff but ferox buster is actually just genuinely really good um and rust scan kind of would have done the very same thing we wouldn't have had to wait just as much so i'm on github i believe this is epi's epi 052 or ben um puts out a lot of incredible stuff 
it has an installation and quick start guide right here. You should be able to just go ahead and install this as part of your repositories. If you wanted to sudo apt update and then install Ferox Buster, fingers crossed it will be readily available inside of your repositories. Uh, if you're using apt like a Debian-based system or Kali, Ubuntu, etc. Um, I actually didn't see it on Ubuntu when I ran this previously. I did have to go ahead and install it just from like, oh, um, the releases, which it offers just there on the page. If you wanted to even do the gross and disgusting pipe curl to bash, run arbitrary code from a foreign location without looking at it, whatever. It's nice and easy. But uh, this should go ahead and download and install just fine for us through the repositories. Let that come through. Oh, and it will retrieve sec lists just as well. If you aren't familiar with sec lists, sec lists is a uh, list of security words or common things that might be known and present within security put together by Daniel Meisler. Um, and I'm going to get your name right this time, Daniel. I know I always say Meisler and I totally say it wrong. Meisler, from what I understand. <laughs> so forgive me if I'm still wrong somehow. Uh, but this will help you get through specific things that you might be looking for. Like if you're brute forcing passwords or usernames or potential th file system locations, etc. Uh, in this case, we're going to be brute forcing different locations. Like, hey, what are common file names uh, given a web server, etc default.php, index.php, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ferox Buster will be recursive by default. So if I actually just go ahead and run Ferox Buster, it needs a URL, which we know going back to our web browser is just that 10.10.1.1.2.44 IP address, paste it in there, and it should just carve through stuff. I'll let this go. You can see, okay, it's going to end up grabbing the sec list discovery web content raft medium directories that it would have found. Uh, I can see just at the very, very top here, and oh, I might have uh, bumped it a little bit, but console was a new page that it had found, and that is better than us where we were beforehand, where we just didn't have any idea what we were looking at anywhere. Uh, so I'll just let that continue. It will start to carve through that console page. Oh, it even found another uh, secure image. This guy here, my face is in the way. But let's go navigate and explore what slash console might be. I'll let that keep running so we have enumeration going in the background. And we'll go to slash console. Ooh, okay, here we have a login. Um, we can just do a stupid guess, admin, admin. And looks like we actually have a captcha to work through. I am notoriously bad at captchas. Nope, oh, okay, incorrect details. Um, let me view the source of the web page. Oh. It wants me to resubmit that because I did make a post request to submit. Whatever, that's totally fine. Uh, let's go ahead and review the HTML present here. Again, I hit Control U on my keyboard or right clicked uh, View Page Source. So I don't see any glaring HTML comments sticking out. Um, I do see the form developed here to grab a username and a password. We also have the CAPTCHA that seems to be generated by a console secure image, secure image play.php. Uh, oh, that downloaded a WAV file, which is kind of weird. I'll open that up. I think it might just be an audio rendition, like if you were to try and press play on this. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I don't know how much is really going to go into building out the CAPTCHA. Um, I will break the fourth wall just a bit and refer to the fact, hey, I did go ahead and explore and play with the secure image show uh, while I was going through this naturally, when I went through the very, very first time. Depending on the hash that you choose, you end up like specifying, hey, a new capture that might be rendered. Or if it's even random each time. Uh, but these pages here, the secure image show.php and the secure image... Uh, files just have directory indexing on. So when I was doing some research, there was uh, a couple things that could be done with this. Uh, it looks like there is an authentication bypass that could be done. Uh, there's even an, another blog post from I Don't Play Darts, who I often refer to for like PHP filter file inclusion. Uh, but this is way back in 2011. So it's kind of an old gimmick thing. Um, it actually has an exploit or something that you might be able to do in PHP itself. So you have to run that through PHP. But as far as I can tell, all it does is it lets you bypass the um, CAPTCHA, 
which isn't going to give us a whole lot if I don't know we aren't doing that. I don't. It depends if we just trying to retrieve their password, are we trying to impersonate the account, etc. But if you want to do some research, there is some stuff that is, I guess, well known, vulnerable in secure image in that PHP captcha uh, software. With that said, I have uh, rambled for a little bit way too long. You could explore some of this if you wanted to. Uh, but there was more here that we could actually pull out of this. You might have noticed, because you're quick and smart and actually very observant, that there is a JavaScript function right here at the very, very top. It's JavaScript code, so it's going to run client-side within our web browser. and actually has a handle submit function defined, which interestingly enough is defined as the on submit like handler for when it is submitted. The form is submitted, right? And it runs the function handle submit. Now, this is with obfuscated and uh, packed JavaScript code. You might be able to notify it or detect that, hey, it's function with packer spelled out as the argument letters, P-A-C-K-E-R. And all of the code in here looks a little bit obfuscated and not as easily readable. Uh, however, if you scroll all the way to the end, there's some weird strings in here it says, hey, uh, I'll zoom in on this for just a quick moment. Document clicked, value, yes, console log, Fred, I turned on PHP file syntax highlighting for you to review JSON, uh, which seems kind of odd. So if you wanted to, you could go ahead and copy and paste this. There is a JavaScript, excuse me, uh, deobfuscator. And we could go to really any of these or like a JavaScript beautifier. Uh, if I just go ahead and slap this in, Let's see if it actually returns anything out for me. That one didn't do much. Uh, I wonder if there is a packer that's actually used here. Yeah, we can click on packer. And there we go. That, that has something new. This actually displays kind of what we read aloud moments ago was, oh, if the document clicked set to yes, Fred, I turned on PHP file syntax highlighting for you to review from JSON. Um, now, bear in mind... We don't have any PHP syntax highlighting displayed for us at the moment. Uh, looking through this HTML, it's just HTML. It's not the PHP syntax that we might expect. But uh, something that I noticed is that we were, in fact, accessing an index.php file. And actually looking at the headers of these requests here, if I try and load the page, uh, I hit F12 on my keyboard to open the developer tools. You can see, scrolling down, hey, you know, requesting these pages, this is Apache. I was hoping it might tell me, oh, this is PHP, but you can see a PHP session cookie and plenty of others. So we are, in fact, loading PHP. If PHP syntax highlighting were on, sometimes, maybe, in some cases, you'll find a PHPS file, or the file extension is .phps. And this requires maybe a leap of faith or maybe just a little bit of you knowing, oh, that's indicated by file syntax highlighting. But it's worth checking if you see any .php files. Maybe sometimes, I don't know, there could be a .phps file that will actually show you, again, the source code of the PHP script and give you that syntax highlighting. This actually gives us the behind-the-scenes look at what the server, the Apache web server, might have been running and executing server-side because PHP is server-side code. We didn't get to see that. We only got to see JavaScript, client-side code in the HTML, the markup language. So what the PHP page is doing in the background is very, very interesting to us because that might explain, oh, how are we going to end up determining what the username and password really are? So here we go. We can see this does start a PHP session. We include a couple functions, uh, and part of me wonders if we can go ahead and read these now that we know we could use just an S at the very, very end of the file. Yes, looks like we can. Ooh, so I'll dive into that in just a moment. I kind of want to read through the rest of the code here. Um, I wonder if we could do the very, very same for all of the secure image PHP stuff. No. Uh, oh, that should have been through console. Should that not have? Yeah, let me paste that in. So you can see the PHP file is there, but the S file is not there. And we would have been able to see that in our directory listing. So that's not all that interesting. But let's get back to our index.phps and continue to read through this code. We have a variable show error, show capture error. We're checking if the user is set in the post request. And if it is in fact set, 
and we have clicked set to yes, which our JavaScript should end up doing, right? Uh, then we create a new secure image that defines the captcha. And we can check else if valid user post is valid user is valid password. And it will set a cookie based off the username and the password and then go to the mfa.php page. Ooh. So that's kind of interesting because we might just be able to straight up go to mfa.php. Nothing else in that HTML that's all that interesting. But we could very well just maybe navigate to mfa.php. No. How about phps? No. Doesn't show us that. So uh, that probably needs the cookie, right? But now that we know how the authentication works with this code here, and we actually saw those is valid user and is valid password functions inside of this functions.php script that is included, we could try and copy that out. That takes that S at the end, right, of course. And then we have an is valid user, user argument that's passed in as a function. And then we take the bin to hex. Okay, so it's just gonna end up working with the hex data, hexadecimal. And then we check if user is equal to the login user. Mm. But login user is not defined anywhere else, so that must be present in this config.php. Could we find that just as well? Yes, okay, and that actually defines it in hexadecimal right here. And we could simply explore that in our terminal. If we echo out this hexadecimal value, just get it into standard output, let's pipe it into a quick way to be able to decode hex from your bash command line. You can use a built-in XXD, and if you reverse it, tack R, you still want to be able to print it out with tack P. So XXD, tack R, tack P with the standard input will uh, as from hex will give you it unhexlified. I think you can also do this with a like read it from centered in this way. Does that work? It does. So you don't even need to if you wanted to just run xxd tag r tag p and then use the less than less than less than syntax, everyone's favorites, that will decode hex for you. So a little bit quicker, a little bit faster, uh, better than opening up CyberChef like a normie, uh, better than firing up Python like a weirdo like me. Uh, it's good to do that in bash. And now we have another function here, Fred, let's talk about ways to make this more secure, but still flexible. What <laughs> is valid password? This is a function that was determined if it had a correct password, right? You saw in the authentication process, it'll take the MD5 hash of this password and then check if the substring negative three is equal to zero, zero, one. Uh, what is that? Is that just checking if it has like the last values ran? That That is PHP code, bear in mind. So if we wanted to, we could check out, hey, if I had PHP installed, you could use tack A to interact with this in an interactive mode. Let's just say, oh, you have a, a string here. We'll call that variable equal that. Now I wanted to echo this variable out. It's simply a string. But if we took substring of a variable and then negative three. It's just the last three letters. It's the last three characters of ing for a string. So all it's doing is taking a hash, whatever it is, and it will return true if it ends in zero, zero, one. Uh, so we could probably fake that on our own, right? Like if we wanted to get this to work, we could just make we could just figure out what hashes into something that is going to end in 001, right? Let's do that. Uh, let's go ahead and create, I guess, like a, we'll just make it a script, hasher.py. I'm going to make Python code, so forgive me. Let's go ahead and add a shebang line because that is good practice. And people that don't think so can do something else. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, and let's go ahead and import hashlib, which is that built-in Python library for creating hashes. We actually could just probably do from hashlib import MD5. That way we could use just hey and MD5 object. Um, and I'm actually going to do something stupid where I'm going to import uh, iter tools. And I guess the strings. Because let's say, hey, I want to be able to enter a password that is um, printable characters, right? 
letters, numbers, something that I can enter on my keyboard, not just bytes. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. Like it'd be, it'd be handy if we had the alphabet. So I'm going to import string. I guess let's do uh, from string import ASCII lowercase. How about that? Yeah? So ASCII lowercase is going to end up giving me, if you aren't familiar, um, all of the string values um, in Python. So uh, can I split this nice and easy? Yeah, okay, cool. A string value for letters in the English alphabet. Now we could actually use iter tools and use like combinations with replacement. And this looks awful, I know. But if we said, hey, let's continually add new things to our um, string. Let's continue to add new things because I want to get the hash of A and then, okay, sorry. I want to get the hash of A and then AB and then A, a C and then keep growing this until I eventually find what string will have a hash that meets the criteria of ending 001. Does that make sense? I'm sorry. I know. I think I'm beating this to death. So let's go ahead and write the code here. Let's say, well, uh, count, let's do a while true, right? Cause we can just spin for in infinity to uh, end up making this. Let's say our counter. Yeah. Can equal, um, what? At the end of this all, let's do counter plus equals one. Because I want to get the combinations with replacement of all of the potential letters with how many times I want them all included. And that will be our counter, right? Because I, I will eventually be able to go ahead and say, you know, this is our combination. How about that? Uh, and let's mix this combination or join it all together. Combination. So now we have a new string. So if I print this out, I will um, eventually, if I try and run that, oh, no, expected string instance tuple found. Well, what? What is combination? Isn't combination? Oh, we have to loop through that, don't we? Don't we? Sorry, I'm going to quick do a, a simple candlelight debugging and print out what the heck is my combination value? Uh, we don't need to loop that because I know I'm just going to spiral out to infinity. Um, so we have a combination with replacement objects. And then we can say for, I think it, I think it does make an, an iterator or something. So let's do for combo in combination. And that should be combinations, I suppose. Then we can print out that combo. And that needs plural. Okay, so this puts it all together with one, as you can see, as the length. Maybe I'm overworking this, but it's probably a good exercise to learn. So with that, I actually, let's, let's print that all together. And that will be our combo. I will rapidly, oh, come on, spaces. You didn't have to do that. In Sublime Text, I'm going to hit Control Shift P and then set the indentation to spaces because Python 3 likes to whine about that. So let me run that super quick. And now you should see, oh, am I, I'm not iterating, I'm not incrementing my counter. So let's do that at the very end. Now you should see as I rapidly grow all the potential strings with a varying length of characters with English alphabet. Yeah? So let's take the hash of each of those, right? Now we could say M can be a new MD5 object and let's actually pass in the string. Uh, and I think that needs that as bytes. So let's go ahead and encode that as UTF-8. Good. So now if I print out M hex digest, these are the functions that will come out of an MD5 object from Hashlib that will allow me to actually see, okay, what is the hash of each of these? So now all we need to do is check if that hash ends with our 001, right? Um, we'll call it the hash because hash is a keyword in Python. So we'll say if the hash dot ends with um, 001, Right. What we want to end up doing is we want to go ahead and print out the original string 
and I guess the hash just as well. And then we can exit because we, if we were to break, we would still be inside the for loop and then still iterating. So let's just go ahead and kill the program with an exit. With that, I can just straight up run this. And now on the right hand side, I didn't have to print anything, so I could just get a single result. Looks like ABKR will return an MD5 hash that ends in 001. So ABKR is a fine string for us, and we know that we need the username of JSON test account from our previous XXD uh, work here, JSON test account. Let's go back and actually use this now. Let's do JSON test account with AKBR or something. And now let's hope that I can get this CAPTCHA right. Yeah? Okay, so now we are at MFA.php. We have a cookie set for us. Um, can I see that? I have cookie manager installed. So yeah, I do have these two variables and values set. Now we need to go ahead and I guess allegedly brute force a MFA code, do we not? Oh, looking at the page here. I hit control U on my keyboard again. So yeah, can I use the very, very same uh, JavaScript obfuscator? And that not matched? What are you talking about? Well, I guess we can still read it just like we did earlier. Console log Fred, we need you to put some brute force protection on here. Remind me in the morning, Jason. So yeah, okay, so we are gonna be brute forcing this. Um, question is, it's gonna be four values, one, two, three, four. So a four digit code. We could brute it like procedurally, like one at a time counting up from zero, 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 zero to nine, 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 nine. So let's try honestly, just probably the boring and basic baby way to do it and just procedurally send four digit codes. Um, this honestly shouldn't be too bad. We could probably just do this in bash, to be honest. Um, we know, hey, let's take a look at the page here. This is going to end up sending a code uh, variable, like for part of the HTTP post request. This is going to end up sending a post request to MFA, to this page here. So let's try to use curl and post to that. Uh, actually, I... We need to supply a cookie. I think that's what's happening here. We're getting redirected, are we not? Uh, we, we should be supplying our cookie. Yeah, it ends up sending back a location.php. So let's use a cookie. Um, we need our user to equal, what is it? JSON test account. Um, and we saw open our cookie editor here. Let's go back to that page. JSON test account, JSON test account, and ABKR as our password. And I think that's all that we need. PWD equals ABK. I don't know if we need to supply. Oh yeah, we don't. So we don't need to supply the PHP session ID because that'll do that naturally for us. So that works and we're getting the response back, but it would be great if we could actually go ahead and post now, tag X, with the data of our code being like 0000. We'll submit that. Okay, and now we see the result incorrect code. Right, so we'll just simply loop through that. Uh, the way that we could probably do that is do a for i in in bash, um, excuse me, and then we'll go ahead and use our zero 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 zero. So it's already padded. It already adds the four potential digits that it could be. And then we'll use a do on this and then end it with a done, separating it by our semicolons here. Now, obviously we'll need to change the code that we supply We'll add just a dollar sign I being our iterator there. And then we hit enter on this and we will repeatedly see, hey, incorrect code, incorrect code, incorrect code. Uh, this might jitter a little bit as we're downloading new things, but the best way for us to see this is realistically probably going to be like piping this to word count. Oh, and actually we should make, we should make curl silent. So there we go. Now we have just the uh, word count results. So a single line to determine one page. Uh, 
And what we could do is we could check, oh, if this value changes, like if there is any different amount of words present on the page or characters or lines, right? If there's anything different about the page at all, then we probably got something worth looking at, right? So I know I've just built out kind of this gross and disgusting thing, but let's actually grep tack V on that output for exactly that line. So we won't see any results right away, right? Other than uh, if we were to actually check with an if statement, if, and inside of the square braces, a bash kind of quote here, if the exit or return code of the previous command, if that was equal to a zero, that means it succeeded. That means there was something other than that previous line present in the output, which tells us that the page had changed. So in a horrible way, we could then do echo, found it, and then probably break, and then end our if statement with an fi, right? So if I run this, still no output, still nothing changes, nothing's going on. But what we could do is actually echo the current iterator that we are on right now. So now we can see our progress as we increment 000, 001, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until we eventually find it and we'll see that the page has changed in its output and response. So I'll let this run for a little bit. Again, because it's procedural, it's slapping this thing one number at a time, which is kind of not as good. And maybe we could spend some time trying to script out some asynchronous, like multi-threaded concurrent thing to beat this up. Uh, but maybe that's another video just as well. I'll pause the recording and I'll get back to you once this is done. Okay, so... It says it found it with the response of nothing. I'm assuming it's gonna end up being a redirect for number 1335. In my case, uh, that number might be different for you. I don't know, but okay. Entering that in, that looks like that is the correct thing. And now I am in a file browser and file viewer um, seemingly application here. So if I, I don't know, try to browse, ooh, just the root directory. I entered a forward slash there to represent, oh, the root of the file system. Uh, you could see anything, et cetera. Interesting, could you see anything in like home? Ooh, yeah, so there's Fred and Jason. What is in home Fred's directory? Nothing. What is in home Jason's directory? Ooh, he has a user.txt and an SSH directory. So maybe we could actually retrieve some of those. If I did home JSON user.txt, hello, can I retrieve that? Yes, yes I can. Okay, so that is how we could kind of say, hey, we found our user flag, although it's not a full shell just yet. Please submit, you got this. You can figure it out, try hack me, I know you can. Whatever, we're moving on. Um, I'm also wanting to check out Jason's um, SSH directory. Does he have, I guess, authorized keys, right? Ooh, okay, so that failed. Permission denied. Uh, how about his public key? That pub. Ooh, that actually came back. Um, could we get his private key then? Yes, apparently we can. Okay. So, because we knew that SSH is open, and we have these user accounts that have their credentials here, uh, we could actually use this private key as a means to get on the machine, knowing that, okay, we will see a user JSON. Uh, we'll have to enter a new line at the very, very end of this file. But, if we actually make that only readable by us, so it's a valid IDRSA key. And then we know that this is protected, by the way. You can see this says encrypted at the very, very top. So we'll have to run something like SSH to John, uh, something with John the Ripper, right? Can I actually locate that? Okay, here it is. So SSH to John on this JSON file, and all of this output, we can redirect it and say, oh, you know what, we'll give that for John.txt perfect and then we can run uh john the ripper in all reality on for john.txt uh, i do have rock you already set up in my user share wordless directory so if i run that maybe john the ripper 
will be able to crack that and determine the password. Looks like it did. 1A2B3C4D. So with that, we know the password for this SSH key. We have the SSH key and we know that SSH is running. So we could SSH into this machine. Let's go ahead and SSH to Jason at that, the IP address with JSON's IDRSA file. And we know the password up above here is this. Yes, I'm totally cool with connecting to it. Here is the password. I hit Control Shift V to paste it and we are in. So now we could have a genuine shell, read out user.txt and say that we have got on the box. Uh, but the next course of action is going to be getting try hack me to submit this flag. No, trying to privisk, trying to become the root user. Okay, it's just not gonna. <laughs> so we can go ahead now and try some basic privesk stuff. We can check if we can sudo tac l or sudo with any other permissions. It looks like we can, which is interesting. Um, we can run anything as Fred without a password. So we could just straight up specify Fred as the user that we want and then run bash. And now we're Fred. <laughs> so that was a good one. Uh, we could, of course, run like linps or do any other enumeration or check out set UID binaries or any of the other low-hanging fruit. But let's quickly check, ooh, what Fred can do. He can actually run as root. Uh, fail to ban. Ooh. So that's an interesting one. System CTL, you might think, oh, that's got to be a GTF opens. And you would be right. Um, but it, only when you can, like, do something specific with system CTL. Uh, if you could supply the arguments or do something interesting, that could be worthwhile. But we only have the capability to do that as the single command restart fail to ban. So if you don't know what fail to ban is, by the way, fail to ban is a sort of IPS or an intrusion prevention system or, or software firmware that protects computer servers from brute force attacks. Um, in Linux, you could use this to, hey, determine whether or not you're being hammer, you're being attacked by some SSH brute forcing or FTP or port scan, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it actually probably could be used as a privilege escalation vector. And it looks like there are some research already out and about on this. Here's an example. Um... If we could modify fail to ban's configuration settings, it is running, right? Is it not? System CTL status fail to ban. Oh, yeah, he's cooking. He's going. Um, fail to ban puts stuff in etc. Fail to ban. So if I wanted to check out all of these, I don't have write permissions, and all of these are owned by root. I'm looking at that last octet to see, hey, do I have right permissions? Is there a W anywhere? Action.d is where other stuff could be. But again, I don't have any right permission on any of these files. Oh, Fred. Why does Fred own this one? IP tables multiport. Has anyone done anything weird with that? No, that looks just like a regular fail to ban thing. But we can read it and write to it. So maybe that'll give us some access, right? So if it were blocking a machine, which it could be, like we could just hammer it with SSH, kind of like they're doing in this example here. Um, it'll get added to IP tables. And oh, actually they use the very same multi-port one. So when a machine is banned or unbanned, we would have write access to that file. For one thing, because we own it and because action.d, like this directory is kind of writable by us. So could we not just, hey, touch anything? Yeah. So we can create files or modify anything that we really want in there. Do like Vim on NPF. 
add a couple comments. Hello. Even if it says, hey, changing your read-only, you're writing a read-only file, it will still write. Should I not? Oh, did I just kill the thing? Uh. <laughs> did, I just, did I just obliterate that? I'm pretty sure I did. All right. How about if I try to write to this? Hello? Write. File change while writing. W quit save exclamation point. File has been changed since I read it. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, see, so it'll it will keep it will keep my file writes. Because even if I can't write to the file, I can write to the folder, which somehow grants me that permissions. Anyway, 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 anyway. The gimmick here is that we have the ability to run a command when a machine is banned. So what we could do is we could actually vim the IP tables uh, multi-port one. And let's actually modify where a, a machine is banned. I actually want to do something different. I want to say action ban can equal a privisc. Let's actually set bash to be set UID binary. And that way we can just privisc as needed. That's one of my favorite tricks. It's, it's stupid, but it works. So action unbanned will also just for the sake, hey, you know, I don't want to break anything. Let's go ahead and make bash set UID binary. Perfect. That's written. And we know that we could modify. Now that we've made this configuration changes, we can restart the service from fail to ban as root, right? With sudo without a password. So let's run that. There we go. And now let's go ahead and actually check out the permissions on bin bash. Right now it's not a set UID binary, but... If I watch this, good. Let's actually make another terminal down below and let's try an SSH to like John at uh, whatever the IP address is. Let's ban ourselves now. Let's grab this and it needs a password, whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, I don't know how quickly do I need to keep spamming this thing. Can I use like SSH pass? Yeah. So let's use tack p for anything and then let's use ssh john at that so that will fail ooh, ooh 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 ooh, and that saw it right away i don't know if you noticed it up top but now our bin bash has changed and i could run simply bash tack p and now i am root because we banned ourselves we're able to make take advantage of that fail to ban configuration file and now if i move into the root directory i have that root.txt and that is the end of this box super cool that was fun i really like that one um i don't know why try hack me is not letting me submit these <laughs> i guess we can momentarily copy these and try and reload the page how about that try hack me come back Maybe the machine, I feel like the room got changed because now the task, the previous task above it just went away. When it, Remember the one at the very, very start when you started recording this was like, oh, it change me or update me. But no, we did it. We win. We've completed that room. And man, oh man, I hope you had some fun. Uh, I hope there were some little nuggets in there. I hope there was some learning, some good education. But uh, if you feel like there were, or if you got anything out of this video, thanks for sticking with me. Please do all those YouTube algorithm things. You know, I would love if you could like the video, leave a comment, subscribe. Dude, there's a statistic. YouTube Studio Analytics shows you this. And I know everyone says this and it's like the dumbest thing. Like, oh, however many of you aren't subscribed and some of you are. The numbers for me, 55% of you are not subscribed, which is more than half. <laughs> There's like, whatever, a, a s smaller half, smaller portion that are subscribed. So if we had all of you that aren't subscribed, just, oh, you know, click the, the red button right there. Dude, you get more content, we'd have more fun. It'd be a better life experience for everyone. You should do it, you should consider it. All I'm asking, hit the red button. Thanks so much, everybody. Hope you had fun. I love you. I'll see you in the next video. Take care.